see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and today I'm here with uh, Lisbeth Halter Brudal. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining me. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're a, a psychologist living in Oslo, Norway, and we got in contact because uh, we're working on an empathy curriculum, and, and you've also been working on empathy, is that right? That's right, yes. I'm very interested in uh, the theme empathy in different ways in my, in my work as a psychologist. So I developed a method of empathic communication. Oh, and, and what got you started in, in, in that? Pardon? What, uh, how did you start with getting interested in empathy? Yeah, that's uh, a part of my work as a therapist. I often experienced that my patient came to me and felt that I had been offended and um, had difficulties by the remarks that some of the doctors and nurses had taken, given to them, uh, remarks without any empathy. So, by example, a woman said she, that she contacted the doctor wondering if the child she was bearing was okay and he looked to her and said ah the baby is dead and she said it's not true and he said do you think i'm a liar and she can't forget it it's like a trauma for her so she had two traumas losing the child and this remark from the doctor so I had many of these examples that's why i felt it was important to develop a kind of communication on professional basis for the doctors and nurses. And this has gone on for many years now in Norway. Mm. Yeah, so you created a, uh, what, like a 40-hour uh, training course? Training course uh, for uh, doctors and nurses and even for teachers and people working with leadership. And these courses are now spread all over Norway and uh, we have worked with this new for seven, seven years and uh, it's very popular and we have much work to do. Mm. So um, I actually just brought up your website. Uh, it's, uh, there's a, 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 a film, I guess, of the course. So it's like a multi-part uh, course, training course. Yeah, this is um, a course, this, uh, two different kind of course, 20 hour course for people as in their profession and a 30, 40 times course for instructors. And so uh, it uh, is used as a solely in schools, in the, the health service and in different family um, sources, institutions. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, was was there uh, when you developed your course and you became interested in empathy? Uh, where did your knowledge of empathy come from? Was it something you'd studied, or or how did you learn about empathy yourself personally? Ah, uh, well, I've been in psychoanalysis for many years, so I experienced what empathy is by uh, the psychoanalyst. And uh, I think it's very right saying that uh, when you experience uh, the empathy from a therapist, you will also uh, like to to practice empathy yourself. Oh yeah, you know I've uh, asked a lot of people how they became uh, interested in empathy, and quite a few have said, uh, "Well, I had a therapist." And I'd never been heard that way before. And then it made them want to be a therapist because it was such a meaningful experience to have been heard and listened to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, perhaps I have experienced this by my father, too. Ah, uh-huh. So I was very close to my father. 
he was he was very listening to me. Well, I remember him as a person listening to my thoughts and wonderings and uh, yeah, learning me things. Oh wow, that's nice. So you, your father was a very caring and listening person that would listen to what you had to say, and so it really modeled mm. it for you. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. mm. Oh, nice. Yeah. What I think is important in my work is the evaluation we have made of our courses. Uh, because it so it seems to me that uh, working by this method, the professional feel that they have got a tool for working in a way that they feel is the meaning with their work. And they have learned an attitude of empathy, which the patient says that they can feel that something is different in the ward when the, when the staff has learned this. And the other thing is important, that I had courses with uh, professionals from the same ward, doctors, nurses, and they, after a while they said, after we've been to your course, we experienced that we have really got a culture of empathy in the world. We all speak the same language. And uh, some people are coming to the world and saying, what's going on here? We can feel the atmosphere. And so they explain about the course and they feel they have got um, a very important common attitude to where the works. And the other thing is also that people who have gone to our courses learning empathic communication in the profession feel that or they experience that the burned out symptoms disappear. So the uh, a lot of people have the experience of uh, compassionate uh, fatigue and you're saying that through learning empathy and how to be more empathic, it actually uh, addresses that uh, that compassion fatigue, that burnout. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's um, it, it gives it gives sense because, as you know, that um, we have document documented that um, to empathize with a person give you a good health and to be empathized give you also good health. So the interesting thing I think is that empathy is connected with health in a way and also what the professionals said to us, doctors, teachers, leaders, is that this tool gives them a feeling of uh, a, a what I would describe as uh, less helplessness in their work. Uh, yeah. They don't know where to start the conversation, they don't know what to say, what not to say, and now they have a tool, a system, a structure. And just you know, helplessness is one of the most difficult of the feelings which is most destructive for their immune system. Mm -hmm. So what, what I've been looking at is how do we build a culture of empathy, which is really how do we kind of change the whole society to value empathy more? And so you, you've created a course that's geared, that's for the uh, healthcare and for professionals, it sounds like. And, and it's, that would, that's like one way of, of promoting empathy in society. Uh, how do you think we can actually promote empathy kind of in a larger societal scale? I think it's very important to document and um, inform, give information about um, the mirror neurons. Mm. People do not know about this. I can't tell you how many course or how many um, speeches I've given about empathy and informing about 
the mirror mirrors, people don't know about it. And they don't know that we are born with it, that how it develops, and it's good for your health. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so it's like uh, you're, you're saying, like, uh, let people know that mirror neurons, how that works and how we're biologically wired for empathy. That yes. people don't realize that a lot of people think that we're wired to be greedy and selfish and think of only of ourselves. And mirror neurons show that we're really connected to each other. That's right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a big surprise to many of them. And in my opinion, uh, the, uh, 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 we discovered uh, the mirror neurons is as such important to psychology as the DNA was for biology. Secondly, I think it's very important to educate parents in empathy, to let them know about empathy. And I've written about what I invented, uh, uh, what I call a mirror parents. <laughs> mirror Mir parents. Uh -huh. Mirrors. Instead of, I don't know if you know that, it's called, here we call about the helicopter parents, uh, parents looking after children all the time and and uh, different kind of parents role but this is you should mirror your parents thoughts your children's thoughts thinking and then talk to them about what you see so then you're a model of empathy perhaps that's what my father did yeah it sounds like it you you learned it from your father who did the mirroring he mirrored what you were saying and thinking yes. Uh -huh. Mirror parents. I, I I think yes. I talk a lot about that uh -huh. in when I, in my, my speeches, and I write about it in my books. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And so there's helicopter parents who are trying to manage and control, and you're saying that parents uh, should be there and reflect what they're seeing. Yeah, uh -huh. and tell them what they're seeing. Tell them what they're seeing. Uh, you want an example? Yes, please. Uh huh. Uh, a little girl mm, grew up when she was five years old and the parents were expecting their second child and um, uh, they got um, parents got a message from the school that a little girl was kicking all around the other children um, the grown-ups and they said you have to do something with your daughter we can't have that and then the evening uh, the little girl was kicking around in the house and so the parents said, we see you are kicking around. <laughs> we can see you are kicking around. And said, looked at them and said, yes, I'm just as clever in kicking as the child you have in your stomach, mother. And so the whole thing was sold. They understood that she was jealous about the little brother she was expecting. And she wanted to be a clever and she wanted attention. So instead of saying to her, why are you kicking? And you shouldn't do that. They mirrored her. And the problem was solved. That's a mirror parent. Yeah, it's a mirroring. So, um, so you're saying that uh, one, so uh, to build a culture of empathy, we need to get the word out about mirror neurons. And then we need to uh, train parents to uh, have a new style, uh, have a mirroring style, a reflective style uh, that uh, encourages empathy within the family. Yes. And the third thing I already men mentioned for you is to develop and evaluate methods for developing empathy. Which is very clear from our courses. When we and when we um, find out how the empathy quality is before the course and we evaluate how the empathy quality is afterwards, we can see that it is growing. We can develop this empathy through training, exercising. And I can see that the profession, also the, the um, doctors and the nurses themselves are very surprised. It, it's possible, but then it's very important to learn them to lay back and to understand who is the main person in this conversation. It's the patient. 
or the pupil. And when they're telling the story, you will learn not to interrupt, not to comment, not to correct, just telling us the story. And by this, <laughs> uh, it's uh, like it's like they have to relearn something. They have to re relearn the old role of being the competent, the very important person uh, on the earth, learning and telling patients how they are and what's 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 spurring them. Yeah, it's like uh, doctors are kind of see themselves as experts. We're going to tell you how things are. And the empathy is more really being a, about listening and being attuned to what patients are saying and really hearing what they're saying. Yeah, attaining the structure mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of, the, of the method. The, uh, in the bottom is the, we are convinced that we are there to learn the patient to help themselves. We know the patient is the expert of themselves. And so, to help them, we first must, must know where the patients are. What are their universe they're living in? So, the first part is, tell me your story. As you see it, tell me about how you see your situation. You must not interrupt. <laughs> you must not correct not comment and afterwards the second part is you ask them what do you feel and this we want to have a consciousness of the affection affect consciousness and the third point is now you told me your narrative you told me your feelings tell me what you're thinking about this your reflections and if you when you have all this you turn around and you say, "Are you? Well, how would it be for you to listen to me? What I think about what you have told me." So that's a four point. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, looking at it a little bit differently, I've I've enjoyed uh, exploring empathy through metaphor. Like empathy is in is often described as uh, looking through someone else's eyes or standing in someone else's shoes. And that's uh, a metaphor for empathy. And for me, empathy is like a cornucopia. Uh, I don't know if uh, you, you know, uh, I think even a cornucopia is a, a Norse uh, mythology, yes. right? It's, it's a horn of plenty that yes. uh, through empathy, we're able to experience others' feelings and emotions and it gives us like a horn of plenty, a horn of plenty of emotion and experience. And I was wondering if you have a metaphor of what empathy is like for you, kind of is a metaphor. It's like uh, dancing uh, Wiener Waltz. <laughs> it's like hearing the same music. You know, we both know the next step. Or we know the aim of a process, or we are creating a process together. Uh, and we hear some music. I think it's, it's a wonderful feeling of being in an empathy process with another person. Uh, so empathy is like uh, being in a waltz and kind of dancing together and, and knowing what the next steps are together. Uh, yeah. uh, uh -huh. Yeah, and, and at the same time, you're creating something. You're creating a new all thing. It's, it's a new situation all the time. It's not standing still. Maybe so, like an unfolding, like an unfolding yeah. together. Uh -huh. Unfolding together, yes. And it's like feeling it's, 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 it has not an end. <laughs> it's endless. It might be endless. <laughs> Of course it's not, but it might be. Hmm? So, uh, what would be the opposite of empathy? What would be a metaphor for the opposite? Um, I think um, it's emptiness. 
and a metaphor for a person without empathy is like a house where no light in the window and nobody's at home. Oh, it's like a, an empty house with no... Was that a house? A house? A house with no light in it. Oh, mm -hmm. And there's nobody at home. And nobody home, an empty house. A empty dark, house. a dark empty house. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. No so, contact. So what we really want to do is create a, a culture that's a waltz, where the, the, everybody's kind of dancing together, it sounds like. That would be a culture of empathy, maybe, or... Yeah. Yeah, but we must communicate. It must be a communication. In words. I think, um, as a therapist, I experience not only how bad it might be that you say the wrong remark in the wrong moment, but my experience is also that some of the patients tell me how impressive it is when a person is saying just the right thing in the right moment. This is also what we experience in developing this method, is a kind of, a kind of moment of meeting. It, changed, it might change something in you and between you when you have said this right thing and make a movement and a meeting. And some of them say that I feel like a change maker when I'm using this method. I don't know why, but sometimes I can, I can understand that there is something going on. I don't know where I got it from, but it, I have the feeling going on, something between us, and suddenly I know, and I do it, I say it. So that's what I mean, is that uh, to use the method com empathic communication, you have uh, to be courage. You must have the courage to relate. You must have the courage to recognize another person and the courage to exist. I mean, it comes from Latin, exist, existere, um, to make yourself, um, to, to make yourself visible. Three kind of courage. I've written about this in a book I call Courage, and I think it's related to empathy. So we must be more courage if we shall develop a culture of empathy, I think. Yeah, is it, is it, it's like the courage to be present, maybe, to, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I, it's a little scary to be present with someone, you know, not knowing what to do next or, or um, you know, all the different anxieties uh, that we, we have and that kind of make us want to pull back. And I mean, I speak for myself. So I, I yeah. sense that, right? That, so it's like how to be present. And, and uh, I think part of that, though, in a culture, in a sense, people are afraid to be present because there's a lot of judgment in society and, you know, you may not be accepted. And it seems like a culture of empathy would be supportive of hearing where people are. You know, there's courage to kind of to reveal yourself. But if the society is already very empathic and very non-judgmental, it makes that sharing easier. Like, for yeah. example, I think of like your father, like you probably didn't weren't afraid to share your thoughts and feelings with him because he wasn't judgmental. He, want, he wanted to hear what you had to say. So he created a space so you could share and, and be heard. And there's a lot of environments where maybe people had a father who, say, who would say, you would share something, you'd say, that's not right, that's bad. So they had that judgment that yeah. um, you know, made them afraid. Uh, I agree with you. I think you're right. 
the courage to be present. How do you learn that? By mindfulness. Yeah. <laughs> By yeah. mindfulness. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, tool of empathic communication gives them the courage because they know they have this structure, it's a system uh, to work after, work with, which uh, ended up in empathy. Where the, where the aim is empathy. So we need some, we need some um, way of developing this. So you're saying that by having a, a kind of a curriculum for empathy that you can learn the uh, skills of empathy and that kind of gives you a courage as well, having those tools. Yeah. That's uh, what I mean. Yeah. That's what, and that's what they say. Uh, when they have practiced this for some time and they say it in the evaluation too. Mm -hmm. So, could you give an outline of your curriculum? How is it built? What's the oh, the overall the overall uh, structure? It's forty hour uh, curriculum uh, course that you have, but kind of in a short. How, what what do you cover? It's um, it's divided between uh, theoretical information, which is about existentialism, uh, self psychology developmental psychology, and positive psychology. And it's uh, also built up upon exercises, 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 training and training and training. And when we train, we are um, talking together what we experience, teaching each other what we experience, and we train again and again. So we are um, we are very eager in in trying to connect the experiences we do in training with the theories which we develop together. And it is the forty hours course. It's also um, it's also a point where very important to to understand how to teach other about this method. So this, you should uh, adopt the theories, adopt the method, and adopt the way how to inform others about it. Mm. Well, I like that, that part of passing it on. I, I think uh, sometimes I think we need like a evangelical empathy. Uh, I don't okay. know if you're... In, in America, there's a, a you know there's churches that are called evangelicals, and they're very uh, proselytizing. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I don't know if you're, uh, I know in German it's evangel evangelisch or that's uh, I don't, evangelical anyway. It it means that you you know you have it, in terms of religion and then you pass it on. Right, you want to uh, proselytize. Well, yeah. You want others to adopt it as well. And sometimes uh -huh. I think we need like a evangelical empathy. And it sounds like that's what and that's what really resonates with me is that we want to not only learn it ourselves, but really pass it on and create that passing on uh, part. Yeah, that, that's very true because that's. Sometimes when we finish, they say, oh, I want to go on with this. How should we do it in the hospital? And they go to the other wards and say, do you want to learn about empathy? <laughs> yes, we want to learn about empathy. Uh, so it's like a need sometimes, I think. When you really experience it, you want to pass it on. Uh, where, where does your, your curriculum kind of grow out of? Are you grow, taking it from kind of psychology, um, there's processes like nonviolent communication, which were started by Marshall Rosenberg, which is kind of based on the work of Carl Rogers. Is there kind of a a, a history, a, you know, a thread that you're using uh, for your curriculum, kind of, or is just something you developed from? No, I've developed it myself. Oh, okay. Because I think it's it's very um, it's. Um, seems that we meet uh, 
um, a wish in the patient by doing it, it in this way. Patients want to be listened to? Yes, we listen to them. And when they are telling us the story, they get very emotional, most of them. And then we ask for the emotion. And when we have got the narrative, and when we got the emotions, then it's natural to stop for a while and say, what do I mean about it? What, is, what does it mean to me? And this point is very important. To talk with the patient about the meaning with life, for the meaning with my, my, my illness, with the, why, why am I so unhappy? What is the meaning? And I think, well, I just wanted to ask you before we finish, could you explain to me why this is so popular? We have such a good results all over. And I think it's because of this. But it's not that. Because they also, when they have given to us their lives, the history, feelings, reflections, we are giving back to them what we have seen. We mirror them. And we more than mirror them. We give them our, something of our own life. We are present with them and we, we would like to discuss and create a new situation perhaps. We are discussing with them. But all the time it's very clear it's you that can help yourself. I'm here with you. Yeah, so it sounds like this is very much in the medical field. Uh, are you doing expanding into the education system as well? Uh, because here in the United States, there's some efforts to bring empathy training into uh, the education system so that uh, we'll have, uh, there's an organization called Ashoka that wants to bring empathy to make it a core part of the curriculum so it's like math, science, you know, language, empathy. And it uh -huh. would be through the whole system, you know, from kindergarten through maybe the 12th grade. Um, That's interesting. No, I, the, what we have done is that we have gave courses for teachers. Uh, so that when they meet uh, pupils in difficult situations, they are meeting in the same way as the doctor meets the patients in empathic communication. But not yet. We are not come to the education system. Mm -hmm. Not yet. But you're doing it for teachers so that you can train teachers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we train teachers, yes. And also uh, in the, um, what is it called in English? Um, employee employee review when uh, they have some difficulties in the uh, in the work and the lead leader are talking to them with empathic communication mm -hmm. yeah well uh, there's uh, you know people talk about here in the United States about well you know the teacher should have empathy with the children but sometimes the people who are giving empathy or kind of being present and all that, they need it as well. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And then, yeah. so the teachers need it, the, the healthcare workers, you know, the social workers. Uh, so they need an environment where they can go and be heard as well. Like the doctors, you're saying, well, the doctor is there to listen to the, uh, the, the patient to be present, but they need it from others, they need to be heard and reflected and to be seen as well. Oh. Um, uh, the, what I can say is that they, need, they um, support each other. When they've been to the course, they t support each other during the day if some of them have difficulties. Uh, but in general, we have the impression that people working in the health work, um, they really need to, uh, they have a feeling that there's something they need to know 
involves empathy. So that's why we uh, are so popular with these courses, I think. Mm -hmm. And how, know something I need. How popular is it? Like how, how widespread is it in, in Norway? Oh, I can't tell you how many courses are being held because I know I, I have um, educated about 50 instructors and they are they are working in a different part of Norway um, so I can't tell you the number but uh, I know it's growing and growing yeah so uh, kind of on a little bit different uh, aspect we you know by email we talked a little bit about um, this terror attack that was in Norway which was a real um, I mean, when I even just thinking about it, really feel a lot of sadness, you know, coming yes. up yes. around it. And um, you had sort of tied that in with empathy. There was a little in the news here. There was a little bit of talk about empathy and how uh, the Norwegians, you know, they had the, you know, they had some, um, you know, kind of memorial uh, there, and it was a very kind of a seemed like a very caring. Uh, kind of a response and a very uh, the empathy was a large part of that that uh, maybe that Norway has this uh, value of empathy and kind of responded in a in a kind of a caring way uh, to yeah. this attack so I wonder if you could maybe talk about your experience there and how it relates to empathy yeah um it's true that the word empathy has now been used in Norway for a, a way which has never been used before the attack. And people ask each other, how is it that we in Norway um, are talking so, about, so much about love after this had happened? The day after the attack, the uh, the Norwegian prince said that for 20,000 people saying this night the streets are filled with love and um, we have the now it was when the uh, course going on the uh, in f two weeks ago there was somebody have suggested that we should gather and sing the song which I suppose you know which is in English called uh, The Rainbow Race by Pete and 40,000 people gathered that day and singing and singing this song and ending up in front of the core singing about <laughs> the rainbow race with a rose in their hand and it was arranged that all over Norway the same song was singing at the same time and so the question is what is this? Uh, Norway has never had such an attack since the war, World War and when I am giving speeches on this as I am more or less um, uh, uh, specialists on empathy in Norway. <laughs> They're asking me, what is this? And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if it's like that we were children, we were children in school in Norway, we learned about something which might be said in, the, in English perhaps. Uh, whichever of you has never condemned a sin may throw the first stone. So it might be that it is an existential wave of the Norway saying we are all people, we are all our faults. Then no one is more important than the other people. We are all in the same boat and we must go together. That's perhaps, I don't know, it might be the explanation. It's so deep in us now, in our culture that we are all equal. It's the, it's the democracy in a way. 
and it develops sympathy. It's very impressive to see these uh, meetings and hear the singing. Yeah. And you know, the king, the Norwegian king, uh, it was uh, in August a meeting. Do you want me to read to you what he said? Sure. He said to us, as a nation, we will remember this period in our hearts, in our experiences, and remember that we have been awakened to a new consciousness. That was three months after the attack. So, yeah. I mean, I feel such sadness, but there's there is also it's like that uh, sense of love too. You know, I kind of could feel it from Norway. You know, that kind of that gentleness and kind of presence. Hmm. We are learning something, I think. We're learning something about empathy. What we are learning, I, I'm not quite sure what we are learning. <laughs> but yeah. something is going on. Uh, a sharing, perhaps. A sharing of pain, sharing of uh, sadness, and the sharing. The sharing and sharing, it's a kind of gives you feeling of be together with other people, you're not alone. And it's not up to you, not to me, to condemn other people. It's not it's my not my duty. Yeah. It, it's like the uh the judgment, like the first stone is like uh it's not to it's not to judge and to mm. kind of to go into maybe a, a closing down and a battling, but it seemed like a very open and kind of a connecting feeling. Um, yeah, and it's, it's courage. Courage. <laughs> it's also, yeah. also kind of courage to share these things. Yeah. To let go your own, if you have hatred and uh, sadness and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we saw that here in the United States after 9-11, there was that um, that sense, but then it seemed to change, it became kind of a closing down and, you know, we want revenge or, yeah. you know, kind of a quality, unfortunately. I know that. Yes, I know that. Yeah. yeah. So, we will see what, what will happen. I think what is important we find in the empathic evaluation of the empathic communication is that after 18 months when we go back and try to measure the degree of empathy, it's still there and it's even grown mm. after they have been learned. So it's not going away. I mean, if it's first, I think if the king is right, we are learned, we have been awoken to something new. And, we, and it will never be the same again. Yeah, it's like an awareness of kind of a connection, like an empathic connection. And uh, oh, you can't, you want to get it? You can't forget it. Yeah, it's like it's like the patient said to me, "Ah, this nurse said just the right thing to me at that moment. I'll never forget it. I bring it with me for the rest of my life." It's a moment of meeting. Yeah, I look at, uh, you know, what can be done in a society to bring about that change. And I think maybe, you know, like your curriculum, you know, having a curriculum, um, you know, ways of training, learning about empathy and having a vocabulary to talk about it, too. Uh, in the sense that we can have this sense of connection, but it's helpful to also be able to articulate it, say this is an empathic connection, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what I mean mm -hmm. by that? To, uh... Uh, I'm not quite sure if yeah. I know. Well, Sorry. it's like we empathy is like an ongoing, it's happening all the time. I mean, through mirror neurons, we're empathizing with each other and, you know, we can have things that kind of inhibit 
empathy. And it's good to have a vocabulary to say, well, empathy is just part of what's going on in our lives. And here's ways, things that uh, are obstacles to empathy, you know, maybe judgments or obstacles to empathy. So to have the experience as well as the, uh, the cognitive, you know, the vocabulary to articulate what's happening, we can, we can have this very wonderful empathic connection you know, through maybe a mirror neuron, you know, just resonance mm -hmm. with each other, but also to have this vocabulary to be able to describe what's happening to kind of bring together these, uh, you know, em emotional and kind of cognitive functions. Mm -hmm. I think the empathic language is very important. It's a, it's a kind of language. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, how should I say it? Uh, it's like, poetry in a way. It's an, perhaps it's a new language we are developing. Music in it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, music in the, in the language. It's yeah. Like, uh -huh. uh, uh, Wiener Wolf language. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, where, where are you going with your work now? Um, I, I understand that you're retired, but it sounds like you're still giving talks and I don't know, are you still writing books and just wondering where yeah. you're going with your empathy work? I, I am retired officially, but I can't stop working. It's so many <laughs> interesting things to do and uh, I'm writing books. My last book about, is about uh, consciousness and about mindfulness and I um, it's, I'm very interested in science fiction. Uh, so this is what has been my interest in, and I've written about it in the book. For the time being, I am giving courses and courses, and uh, I'm also a supervisor, and writing about some thinking about a new book. But I've written 17 textbooks now, and one novel. So, I wonder what next will be, I don't know. You know, uh, we also develop empathic self-observation. So when I feel I'm wondering about things, I'm sitting down and giving myself an empathic self-observation. What's going on? I'm telling myself a narrative. I'm feeling what... I try to understand what I'm feeling, what is my reflections about my situation. And so, I talk to myself. What is the right thing to do? Oh, how does that work? Can you? What does that look like? Can you uh, do a little bit of reflect that reflective listening, self reflection? Uh, I'm. What What are my real values for the time being? What is important to me? Um, and I'm. I'm married to a psychologist, and we have two children. And I have five grandchildren, which I love to be together with. So it's like uh, all like um, finding out all the time what is good to do for me and where I am now in life. So are you saying it, it's kind of like a, a dialogue, an inner dialogue with, within the with from the different. Uh, parts of yourself? Is that? Is that yeah, uh, perhaps the perhaps the main source is what I receive in uh, meditation. I meditate twice a day, and uh, the dialogue. <laughs> the meditation is kind of dialogue. I think. Well, that's one thing I do with the metaphors. Uh, sometimes, you know, you'd mention the metaphor of the, the house that's uh, the opposite of empathy, the empty house with no light coming in it. And then there's the, uh, the waltz of empathy, right? <sighs> and then you can set up a dialogue between the two. What, you know, the, the, uh, the house, the empty house talking to the waltz and back and forth. So that's a little bit of a dialogue uh, process. And it's kind of interesting how that can kind of evolve. So is it kind of that method that you use, like a dialogue like that between different uh, parts of yourself? Or 
No, no, I can't follow you there. No. Oh, okay, a little. Uh -huh. No, no, I can't that. No. Uh, you asking about the in the dialogue? Is yeah, that? what that looks like. Uh huh. <laughs> it's a uh, kind of feeling that is there is something right to do, and I want to know, find out what is right for me to do. And so I use meditation. Oh, I see. And, uh -huh. and suddenly I come up with a solution. I can't explain why and how. And suddenly I know, oh, of course. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Do you know that? Yeah. Uh -huh. You can feel it. Yeah, you, you know feel. That? You can feel what the right answer is because it has a vis visceral feel to it and it just feels right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Have, have you written? I was just, I actually just showed your website. Uh, there's a picture of you and uh, your whole series of books along the, the side uh, that you've done. Um, are They're all in, I guess, Norwegian. Are they, in, uh, are any of them on empathy? About empathy? Yeah, the book about positive psychology mm -hmm. is about empathy. And um, <laughs> I read a book of psych. Uh, how is it in English? Psychopathy. Mm -hmm. Psycho. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Oh, the psychopaths. Uh, psych yeah. uh, psychopathy. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Which is kind of like the opposite of uh, empathy. Exactly. Yeah. So, also the not the last book but book before about courage is also much about empathy the courage to be empathic mm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah that's the <laughs> interesting part what is what did you kind what was your how would you summarize that the courage to be empathic what is the kind of your summary of that yeah you know, i told just what i said that's a courage of few things to relate uh, the courage to recognize the other and the courage, as you said, to be present or, as I said, to exist, mm -hmm. to uh, be visible, stand out with yourself as the person you are. This is, a, this is very good qualities for um, being empathic. Mm -hmm. Well, is there any other uh, aspects of empathy that you'd like to cover? What do you think are other top a aspects that are important to uh, talk about? Then? Um, it's one thing we have um, experience about teachers as well as professionals um, is that they talk about empathy, um, pain. The, some of them, nurses or the doctors say that sometimes we can't stop, stop feeling empathy. We are so tired and we are so occupied and we are so uh, compassionate to the patient that the patients that when we go home we can stop working in their in their own mind. How is it possible to stop this? And I think it's a very important aspect uh, with empathy and the um, the um, mirror reverence, the fire. How is how should we work to moderate the firing for some people? And for some, this is the problem. So, so what we say in Norway now, it's very, how should I say it, not, not very popular, but many of us are training in mindfulness. And it seems as if mindfulness is a very good method for moderate the firing, if that is the problem. I met some children. Or I met some parents who say, 
tell us that the problem is that the children are so empath empathic and so compassionate to to the comrades, to the others, children in school and the kindergarten, that they're talking about them all the time. And they know with, how the other children are, how the other feel, their, their, um, the parents are divorced, how could I try to, what can, what can I do for, the, for them? And so the parents don't know how to stop it. <laughs> uh -huh. You see? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's a new thing we have discovered in our courses that we are working with it. I don't know. Do you have an idea? Um, we... Yeah, it sounds like what you're saying is that as we're, if you develop empathy, you become very empathic, the mirror neurons or, you know, you're mirroring what's going on. And that, uh, that maybe the, you're starting to lose yourself. It's like your needs, what's what's available for you, is going on for you, is is uh, is kind of getting lost. Is it like this? It's, it's, it seems like that. Yeah. So it's um, it's uh, yeah. It's kind of uh, not being able to disconnect and maybe have your needs and values and feelings be heard too. And mm. how do you bring your own mm. uh, feelings to the surface and, and share those so that uh, mm. you're em over empathizing? Yeah, over empathizing, losing. Yeah, yeah it's and uh, how do uh, yeah and how do you kind of have that sense of self? Right, you're so mirroring everyone else. I mean, we I have a dance uh, uh, instructor. I do like a freestyle dance uh, here. And I've talked with uh, Ava, who, who kind of leads that a lot. We've talked about empathy. And she said she grew up uh, where she was always thinking of other people's needs because her mother was had died of cancer and had a long, you know, a period mm. of, of, of that. And she was having to be kind of present and she was never had time for herself. Yeah. And so now she's very conscious about developing boundaries. And yeah. so she doesn't even want to empathize a lot. She says, I empathize too much. I need to develop these boundaries to yes. really know who I am. Because I don't even know who I am anymore. So um, for me, I've always had very strong boundaries. You know, I've always been very independent and only child. You know, and so I had no problems with that. For me, it's like learning to be more, <laughs> and you know, more open, more connecting. So yeah, I see. Um, yeah. So it seems like the question is, uh, how do we have a sense of self as well as kind of be open? Yeah. Yeah. And we meet the same problem among some leaders too. They're so empathizing with the, the employees all the time, all the time, all the time, that they can't stop it. So the problem for them is to find the boundaries, as you say. But they do, in a way, they think it's, they're doing the right thing by empathizing all the time, but it's not that correct. Well, what is the problem there? They're feeling it's there's some discomfort in that, or they're they're feeling they're losing themselves, or what is the they actual feel problem? Too much responsibility. They feel too, too much responsibility, responsibility oh. for the other people. Uh -huh. I think it's a question of responsibility. And it, perhaps it's the same with the children. They feel a kind of responsibility for other people. And the question is why. So it's, it's a long, <laughs> long discussion. But I think it's a problem. It might be a problem. Sometimes we meet it here. Uh huh. Yeah, it's good to look at the obstacles and the problems of, of empathy too. Uh, mm -hmm. The part might be a matter of holding everyone's needs and values equally in humanity. So, um, like the idea of empathy isn't about self-sacrifice. 
you know, some it's like here in the United States in the 1950s. And so women were supposed to sacrifice themselves for the family. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. what your needs are, you know, what you're what you're feeling is not supposed to be important because you're supposed to think of the family and the husband and the well-being. Mm. And then there, it leads to a great deal of unhappiness because you're not being seen and felt. So it's how do you hold your needs and values uh, equal with others? Yeah. So maybe kind of related to that. Uh, Quite related to that, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, yes. it looks like uh, we, we have a lot more to uh, we can explore. So um, we've gone for about an hour. Is there anything, uh, final thoughts that uh, you feel we should cover? Uh, in Thank you. Yes. Yes, I appreciate it very much to talk with you. And I, I think you're doing a very important work with this center. And I want to wish you good luck. Oh, thank you. Further on. Yeah. And uh, I'm so grateful or excited too to hear about with the work that you're doing um, because it's, I think, uh, to network, that we can network with all these different uh, people around the world now who are doing work around this and mm -hmm. start looking at uh, how we can create a global culture of empathy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great idea. May I ask you what will happen with this interview now? Um, I uh, put it online, um, I kind of edit it, do some editing with it, uh, I think there doesn't need much editing, but, and then I put it on uh, YouTube, and it takes maybe uh, within a week it'll be on YouTube, mm. and uh, then I send it out to, you know, our, our community, we have, uh, you know, maybe 6,000 people on Facebook and probably another 30, 40,000 on other kind of groups and just... Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, it's very interesting for me to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Um, and uh, also, you know, we had talked uh, previously about the curriculum. You know, one thing I'd like to do is have an online curriculum I mean, that's how we kind of got started, right, in our dialogue was uh, uh, initially, I think you saw the website that we're working on a curriculum, an empathy curriculum, and you, I think you'd sent me an email about yeah. your work. And yeah, in, yeah, it's a curriculum, and, uh, but it's, of course, it's in Norwegian. Mm -hmm. So if, I don't know if you have any Danish or Swedish contact, because... Norwegian and Swedish and Danish, we understand it other language very well. Somebody could translate it for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we could find someone. Uh, or, or that. Uh, but that that's something we're working on is a online curriculum. That's kind of, but right now I'm kind of focusing on, on these uh, interviews. Yeah, I and, see. Um, I'll, I'll have, I won't put this part in that we're talking now. I'll have cut, you know, but um, uh, but we're also doing other interviews. So if you know of other people that you would like to have like a panel discussion, like we can bring in uh, uh, like three other people and have a dialogue around this topic. And, and you're welcome to moderate it as well. You know, Thank you. So yeah. um, we're doing like an, a conference, an online conference and uh, so uh, we do a panel discussion or a circle discussion, and it's for an, for an hour, and then we uh, you know we have a moderator and you can moderate. And then we find three other people and we can just talk about this and kind of explore, you know, a more narrow part of it or yeah. as well. So kind of make that as an option too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank your uh, technical support there too. I saw them setting up, so thank them for their their assistance. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good luck. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So, are you are you? Do you feel complete? Everything been said for yes, now? Yes. Yes. So, okay. 
Yes. The only thing I remember you asked me the question about the body experience in connection with empathy. Oh, did you uh, have more to say about that? Your felt uh, experience? Yeah, I think it's the difference whether I'm empathizing with one or someone is empathizing with me. So when I'm doing this empathic communication, I almost lose the. I I, I don't I don't feel my body as much. I I'm just there for the other person. But when somebody is empathizing with me, I I feel a warmth. I feel my body is singing. I want to smile. <laughs> so it's it is a difference. So how did you feel in this uh, dialogue in terms of empathy? Did you felt feel empathized with or in this in our interview? Yeah, in our dialogue. In a dialogue, yeah, I feel so. I, I, so I feel I feel very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and you? Yeah, I felt. Uh, I sometimes, you know, with the with the, you know, I want to try to be as empathic in the. Uh, in the listening is as well, you know, to kind of, and, but I also want to keep the dialogue kind of going, you know, to have some questions. So sometimes it's a little bit of a balance. So, yeah. you know, between the two. Yeah. You and, have this, you have, you feel the responsibility. Yeah. I have the responsibility to keep a of dialogue, course. you know, and, and also for people who yeah. might be listening, I, I, mean, I hope it'll be interesting, you know, and oh, yeah. so good. yes, very good. Okay, well, uh, it was great uh, talking to you, Elizabeth, and um, we'll we'll be talking again soon, I hope. Um, and I'll send you some emails when everything when the video is online. So yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.